morning. We are going to stand and we are going to sing children's songs. We had Father's Day and sang Father's songs. We had Mother's Day and sang Mother's songs. And we're going to sing children's songs today. Now, if you grew up in the 50s and 60s and 70s, you know all these songs. So let's stand together and sing them. If you're a child of God, you need to sing these songs. <laughs> Praise Him, praise Him, all ye little children. God is love, God is love. Praise Him, praise Him, all ye little children. God is love, God is love. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Zacchaeus was 
come down for I'm going to have Father, we just thank you so much for this day, for you allowing us to gather in your house to sing these children's songs that meant so much to us as we were growing up, that brought memories to our minds of the things that we did as a little child. And as children, we were following Jesus Christ, so today we're still trying to follow you as the best we can. Father, we just ask you now that you bless this service, open our eyes, our ears, our minds to everything that's being said. And Father, just help us to worship you in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. You may be seated. If you are a guest with us this morning, there's a flyer at the end of your pew. If you take that and fill it out completely and place it in the box as you go out of the building, that'll give us an opportunity to know that you've been visiting with us, send you a letter uh, to welcome you to, to the church. And also, if you have prayer requests, put them on the back. And if you're a church member, put your prayer requests on the back. We'll be praying for those in staff meeting if you have a concern. So put it on there. We take that very seriously. Please write down what needs you may have. If you're visiting with us on the internet, on the website or whatever, we just ask you that you like what we're doing and be a part of the worship with us today. Don't just sit there and watch, but participate in the songs and everything that's going on today. Uh, VBS is coming up. It, who said amen? <laughs> VBS is coming up. Have you signed up to help? There are 250 people probably in the service today. 250 could be helping in Vacation Bible School. This is a great opportunity with very minimal risk. I mean, you're bigger than everybody you'll be working with. And very minimal risk, and you can share with them about the love of Christ. That's all you got to do. Just come and love on these kids. A lot of them may not have a father figure. A lot of them may not have a spiritual leader in the home. And this is our one chance to reach out to them and touch them this time. So please volunteer. See Big Dave over here. Big, stand up. Big Dave, if you don't know who Big Dave is. This is Big Dave. See him after service, and he'll get you to the right person to sign up. And speaking of Big Dave, he's been working tirelessly this morning preparing a spaghetti dinner. I heard his wife did a lot of it beforehand. But, so it may be safe to eat. But we have a spaghetti dinner right after the morning service over in the CLC. Plan on staying for it. Uh, they have spaghetti. I know they have baked spaghetti and everything, so plan on staying. If you can't stay, but you'd like to pick it up and take it home, you may do so. Uh, and this, this is no charge for this. This is an opportunity. If you want to donate to the mission trip that the youth are going on later this summer, please do so at that time. And if you want to just make a donation, you can do that, right? Somebody's already asked me this morning. Okay. So to keep that in mind. And the reason I want to do announcements today is I went to a most fantastic meeting the other day called Grief Share. Now, Grief Share, in my mind, when the ladies first presented it to me, I'm thinking this is for ladies who've lost a husband. And they like to get together and, and talk about it and work through it. But it was fantastic. We had a child that died about 30-something uh, years ago. And I wish I had had something like that to go to to work through the grief process, because it took a lot of years to work through it. And this was fantastic. So if you're a lady, and you don't have to have lost a husband. It may be a family member, it may be a child, it may be a parent, it may be anybody in your relationship that you have lost. Please come to this grief share at four o'clock. It meets right down below the, the sanctuary here and you'll get a blessing out of it. There's, there's, there's talk, there's video, there's all kinds of stuff that really add to it. And I was there and it lasted about two hours and I was not bored at any time during the whole thing. It just zipped right by. So uh, plan on coming, and if, if you know somebody that's not a church member that's lost a loved one, please invite them to come to this grief share. I think they will get a tremendous blessing out of coming and being a part of it. And that's all I have to say. So now would you please stand and welcome those folks around you. Tell them how glad you are they're here. Put a smile on your face. Oh. 
come set to rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray, unveil what remains. Come set the hearts ablaze with hope, what wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit,
and let's stand together and sing Blessed Redeemer. Thank you. 
children, ages four to third grade, you know what time it is. It's time for children's <coughs> church. There'll be an adult over here to my door, my right. They'll escort you down to the first floor where you worship on your own eighth level. Parents, you can pick them up on the first floor right after the service. And then you can stay for the spaghetti lunch. Let's all stand together to sing at Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died. seated. There I am. Good morning. Ladies, I'd like for you to do me a favor this morning. Would you please reach up and check your right ear and then your left ear? I found an earring. <laughs> It's not my style, so if you're missing one this morning, I have it. Uh, so it is available for you today, so pick that up when the service is over. I, I tried it, but it just it didn't fit with my brown. So, uh, and I hope you've been reading your newsletter and the bulletin this morning. Uh, beginning July, we are doing no ties in July. And normally when we've done that over the last few years, I will announce to my church family, we do no ties in July and probably August and maybe September. So uh, we invite you to come comfortably uh, as we come together to worship together. Uh, we'll be in golf shirts or whatever you want to wear, but I look forward to those where you're not bound with a tie. But uh, looking forward to that. Thank you for being here this morning. If you have your Bible, let's turn together to Joshua chapter 1 today. We're going to be reading the first five verses in the first chapter of Joshua. And verse 1 begins, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan and you and all this people to the land which I am giving them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness that is in Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. We are beginning a series this morning that I kind of entitled how to enjoy the rest of your life. Uh, we might have called it something like, how do you enter the promised land? Uh, by the way, how many of you know what the promised land is? It is not heaven. Does that surprise you? 
promised land was a place, if you remember, when the children of Israel went over to possess the land, the Lord said to them, now when you get there, you're going to have some walled cities that you're going to have to overtake. You're going to have to drive out the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and all those other ites that were living there. You're going to have to work for the land. You're going to have to till, and you're going to have to toil. And folks, when we get to heaven, I don't want to work, and I don't want to drive out any ites. All the ites that get there ought to be there just like the rest of us. The promised land, instead, is a place where there is a contentment in your life, a, a joy, a satisfaction, a relationship with God that gives you purpose, it gives you meaning, gives you a feeling of being a part of something greater than yourself. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the first couple of chapters in Joshua, learning what does it mean to really live in God's abundance? What is it li like to live in fullness of the Spirit of God encompassing and indwelling our lives? The Apostle Paul told us in 1 Corinthians that the stories and the events of the Old Testament occurred because they would be an example for us. And so the, the principles that we learn, the strategies that are being taught and lived out in these scriptures through the lives of Joshua and other great servants of God and even the people of Israel are examples about what our life can become. Now here's the background of the book of Joshua. After being led out of the nation of Egypt after all of those years of captivity by Moses, the people of Israel have wandered through the desert and they finally arrived at the land of promise. They're on the border of the land of Canaan. Moses, you remember, sends the spies out into the land to go see what's there. And the spies come back. There are 12 spies. Ten of them come back with this report. Guys, that's the most beautiful place we've ever seen. A land that literally flows with milk and honey. But there are giants over there. There are walled cities over there. And we are just nomadic people coming out of the desert. We don't have a prayer of defeating those folks. There are two other spies that come out saying, guys, let's pack our bags. God has already given us this. Let's go and possess what's ours. Instead, the children of Israel decide this is too much for us. So for 40 years, they go back into the desert. They roam to and fro until that generation died and the new generation is alive. Now, the reason to me that's so important is because when I look at the church, I see a lot of people who are living like the Israelites in the wilderness. We have been set free from our Egypt. We have received Christ as our Savior. We know that when we die, we're going to heaven. But for whatever reason, we spend the majority of our life kind of roaming around in the desert, not really willing to follow God, not really willing to listen to God, trying to do our own thing our own way. At the early service this morning, I asked, and I'll ask you guys as well, how many of you have a GPS? Does your GPS ever lie? <laughs> Mine does all the time. Take a left. My wife said, it said take a left. No, I know a shortcut. You ever been there before? No. <laughs> but I know a shortcut. And we're kind of like that with God. You know, he knows where we're going, how to get there, what we're supposed to do. And he tells us in his word and he gives our, his spirit to us and says, this is how I want you to live your life. And we say, no, I think I know a shortcut. I think I know a better route to get me where I want to be or where I think I want to be than following the will of God. And we spend so much of our lives in the desert. When God has a purpose, God has a place for us that is abounding, that is a place of peace and rest and comfort. The nation of Israel is camping for the second time after 40 years on the banks of the Jordan. Joshua is the new leader. He is preparing to lead them into the land of promise. And the book of Joshua begins with God preparing Joshua to lead. And he tells him how to make his first move. Now, when you read the life of Joshua, if you read that recently, you'll discover he is a brilliant strategist. He is an outstanding leader. He is also a man that boldly, absolutely, unapologetically is committed to God. What everybody else does doesn't matter. He has the heart and the mind of God himself. As a result of that, God uses him in some very amazing ways as he serves. In fact, if you remember the story, it is Joshua that leads the children of Israel into the promised land, not Moses. 
It's through following Joshua's example that we can begin to possess that promise that God made to each of us in our lives. God calls it the land of rest. It's a place where you feel good about your life. It's a place where you feel good about yourselves. Where you find satisfaction in your work. You experience joy in your relationships and you learn how to trust God. Basically, it's learning how to live a life of contentment. Isn't that what we all want? Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 12 says this. I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. Isn't that our pursuit? I I just want to enjoy life. I want to have enough. I want to have provision. I just want my life to be good. Sounds pretty simple. Be happy. Help others. Have enough to live on and enjoy my job and the gift of God in my life. Unfortunately, most of us don't live that kind of life. It is amazing to me how many people hate their jobs. You know anybody hates their job? How many times have you said, I hate my job, I don't want to go in, I can't go in? I've been preaching for 48 years, folks. I love what I do. We retired about 10 months ago and been here with you guys about four months. And those first six months of retirement, I almost lost my mind. I didn't know what, well, some of you are thinking I didn't have far to go, but (laughs) I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who I was. Everything I had done has always been wrapped up in doing this and leading in the church. All of a sudden, I'm listening to preachers and I'm thinking to myself, there's got to be something better than this. And it's amazing how many of us go through our lives thinking, well, I'm just punching a clock. I'm just making a salary, folks. If you have the joy of the Lord in your life, whatever you do, you do it as if you're doing it for God, and God will be glorified through your labors. It's amazing how many people don't have enough. Oh, we got enough to live on, but it's not enough. Let me add, have you ever thought about how much would be enough for you? How much money do you need in the bank? Billionaire was asked that question not long ago. His answer was classic. How much do you need? A little more. We always need a little more. Some of us are are trying to, to do something with our lives. Trying to do good. I preach to you every week, and I have for years through the churches that I've been in, and I always make this statement, my my prayer for the church is that every member of the church would take at least one job in the church. Can you imagine what difference that would make? If everybody was doing something for the kingdom of God, if everybody in the church were giving back something because of the bounty and the blessing of God in their lives. What I want you to understand this morning is this. As a child of God, God has promised you contentment. Joy, even abundance. And so if you're ready to make your move, you can begin to take possession of that promise this morning. Today's message is twofold. First of all, it's for the leadership of Holly Springs. Some of you are in a leadership position today and you're struggling trying to move your area of ministry from point A to point B. You ever wonder if anybody's following your leadership? When I was a much younger dad, our, our kids were small. I remember our first snowfall. And I was going to try to walk the kids through the yard. It wasn't a big snow because we were up in Virginia. It didn't snow a lot up there. And we had one, you know, maybe, what, three inches of snow. And the kids were saying, well, Dad, you walk across the yard first, and we'll follow in your footsteps. I thought, that would be great. Man, what a sermon illustration this is going to make. And so I take off. I'm making little steps so they can follow me. And I walk about halfway across the yard, and I turn around, and they're on the other side of the yard rolling snowballs and throwing them at each other. And I'm thinking, you guys are supposed to be following me. I've done that a lot as pastor. 
I thought you guys were following it. When I turn around, there's nobody there. You know, sometimes people say, preacher, we got you back. <laughs> yeah, but I'd like for you to be up where I can see you instead of a mile and a half behind me. So if you're struggling with an area of ministry, hopefully the message will help you. If you're not involved in a particular ministry, but just in your life in general, some of you are kind of still in bondage, and you're longing for something that will set you free. You're stuck in a rut, stumbling through life, living off manna instead of feasting on God's abundance, wandering in the wilderness instead of living in the promised land. It's time for you to make a move. So I want to give you three steps this morning that are necessary for any of us and all of us to take that next step of being what God has called us to be. The catch to this is this. You must do these three things in order. If you have a pen, I want you to jot these down, look at them over the coming week. Number one is this. You've got to be willing to turn the page. Now, here's what that means. You need to be willing to accept the change that comes in your life. you got to be willing to let go of your past. you got to be willing to move forward, to start fresh, to take a new step when the time calls for it. Here are the first words that God spoke to Joshua. Chapter 1, verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. That's power a state, powerful statement. Moses was the great man. God used him in marvelous ways, even in miraculous ways. God had spared him from death when he was a baby floating on the Nile River. He grew up in the palace. God prepared him for a mighty work. He leads the children of Israel out of their bondage in Egypt and has been used by God to part the waters of the Red Sea. By the way, a little side note, doesn't cost you any more. I believe it was the Red Sea. I was listening, a, a professor was talking about that once, and he said, well, you know, there are some errors in the Bible, which kind of caught me by surprise because I believe it is infallible and errant and inspired. He said, there are some errors in the Bible, and he was beginning to tell us about one of the errors, and he said, how many of you believe in that Red Sea thing? And I raised my hand. He said, well, in actuality, it was not the Red Sea the Israelites crossed, it was the Reed Sea. When the transcribers were writing the story, one of them left out one of the E's, and so it became the Red Sea, and and he was talking about that. He began to talk about telling the story that he was sharing with us in a worship service one night. And he said there was a little lady in the church, and she jumped up and just shouted, Praise the Lord! And he kind of was taken aback by that. And so he preached on, saying it's the Reed Sea. The Reed Sea is only a body of water about 12 inches deep. And so that was the water that the Israelites crossed. And she jumped up again, and she said, Well, Hallelujah! And he said, ma'am, I've just pointed out to you there is a mistake in the Bible. Why are you so excited? And she said, well, preacher, you know a lot more than I do. And I didn't study all the stuff that you studied. And I always thought it was an amazing miracle for God to destroy all of the Egyptian army and their horses and chariots in the Red Sea. But now you tell me he destroyed that whole army, drowned all those horses, and wiped away the chariots with 12 inches of water. That is an awesome miracle. God used Moses in amazing ways. He was a great man. He lived to be 120 years old, was buried in Moab. But note this, if you will. When God speaks to Joshua, he says, in effect, it's time to turn the page. Moses is dead. You're the man now to take these people from where they are to where they need to be. Let go of the past. It's time to move on. If I could say to you as a church family this morning, folks, in many of our lives, in many circumstances, it is time to let go of the past. Regardless of how good or how bad, how successful or unsuccessful it's been, one of the great obstacles in our experiencing the kind of life that God wants us to have is we are hung up in yesterday. I've seen churches struggle with that, just like Israel must have. A new leader comes on the scene. And the church constantly reminds that new leader, well, that's not how brother so-and-so did that. That's not how we are accustomed to doing that. By the way, you know the last seven words a church will ever say. We never did it that way before. Just because you never did it like that doesn't mean you don't need to do it like that. Sometimes you've got to turn the page. 
You've got to let go of the past. You've got to begin focusing on what God is doing and what's new. I, I can't begin to imagine Joshua's dilemma, and he takes over the nation of Israel, and everybody says, well, yeah, but Moses did this, and Moses said that, and Moses was like this. And look at the, all the miracles he performed. What have you done? His answer could be something like this. Nothing yet, but y'all watch this. You know, that's the, the redneck in me. Somebody said the last word the redneck ever says, hey, y'all watch this. I hadn't done anything yet, but God's about to move in our lives. Edmund Burke said this. The past should be a springboard, not a hammock. We should learn from the past, but keep moving forward. So we need to ask ourselves, what page in my life do I need to turn? What do I need to let go of? What do I need to finally close the chapter on? And what do I need to begin in my life so that God can be glorified and God can be exalted through me and through my witness? Whatever it is in your past that's blocking your future, folks, you've got to let that go. There are some things that have happened to most of us in this room that if we had the power to go back and change, we would. Things we would never want to experience. Things we never want to experience again. But that's the past. We are living in the present. Turn the page. Number two, stake your claim. God made a bold promise to the people of Israel in verse 3. He said, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. Here's what that promise means for you and me. God wants to give you ownership of every area in your life. The Apostle Paul used this phrase in Romans 8, 37. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And in all things, we are more than conquerors. A good friend of mine sent his son off to college this past year. And the young man was extremely nervous about going away. He'd never been away from home, never been away from his parents. And we talked a little bit before he was to move into his dormitory, and, and he was literally petrified. And he said to me, well, well Mark, what if, I can't, what if I can't get myself up in the morning? My mom always gets me up. She always makes sure I'm up and dressed in time to, to get off to school. What if I can't get myself up? And then what if I can't keep up with the work? And what if I don't have what it takes academically? A few weeks into his first semester, he sent an email to his dad. And in the email, he said this. Dad wanted to let you know I had a history exam today. I just thought I'd let you know. I own that class. By the way, I own my English class as well. In fact, I'm going to own this whole school by the time I'm done. He staked his claim. He'd moved out of his comfort zone and was stretched and challenged, and now he's more comfortable in brand new areas of his life. That's what God wants from each of us in every area of our lives. Whether it's in your job or your home life or your finances, but especially in your spiritual life. So many of us are struggling with sin and with obedience and with burnout. We're living in an emotional vacuum. What you need to know this morning is that God can give you dominion and freedom over all of those areas that hold you back. How do we do that? We stake our claim. Look at your life. Look at every place you set your foot. Home, work, church, ministry, little league. Decide today God has a plan. God has a solution for every need that I have. And I'm going to trust him. Verse 5, he went on to say, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Nobody can hinder you. Does that mean Joshua never lost a battle? Of course not. But it does mean he lived his life under the shadow of God's protection, trusting in God's promises. You can do that this morning. Stake your claim just as God was with Moses, just as God was with Joshua. 
He will be with you. Number three, claim your promise. God went on to say in the latter part of verse 5, I will not leave you or forsake you. The book of Hebrews echoes those when the book says there, I will never leave you or forsake you. Similar to the last words of Jesus in Matthew 28, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You do understand, whether you realize it or not, whether you acknowledge it or not, you are never out of God's sight. You are never out of his mind. He sees us all the time. He is with us all the time. He watches over us all of the time. That's what that wonderful Christmas message is all about. Remember the angel said, his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Not that God shows up sometimes. You you ever pray and say, God, I hope you're going to show up tonight. I hope you're going to show up and worship today. Folks, there's never been a moment we gather together as his people that he isn't here. There's never a moment in my life that God isn't present, that God isn't moving, that God isn't at work. He said to Joshua and to the people of Israel, just like he said to us, every step you take, every place you go, I am with you. I'm there in your victories, and I'm there in your defeats. I'm there in the good times and in the bad times. I'm there in your dark days and in your bright days. You can count on me. Now, sometimes I'm tempted to say, but God, I don't really feel your presence. We talk a lot about feelings. But folks, your feelings don't have anything to do with your faith. You may feel a certain way at some times and a certain way at other times and all those be completely different does not change the fact that if you confess your sin and receive Christ as your Savior, He is with you always. You might be tempted to say, but I don't deserve His presence. Well, let me show you something. How many of you in this room deserve God's presence? Wow, not even the balcony. None of us deserve it. But he's present. Maybe you're tempted to say, but I'm no Moses. I'm no Joshua. God doesn't need another Moses. He doesn't need another Joshua. He needs you. To be you, to live your life in his presence in this community as a reflection of what it means to be one of God's children. Day after day, when you wake up, he's there. As you go about your routine, he's there. He never leaves you. You don't ever have to face your journey of life alone. For those of you this morning that are wandering in the wilderness, who need to migrate from the desert to the Holy Land, you can begin that journey today. A place of promise awaits you. A place of contentment, joy, peace, satisfaction. A land that flows with milk and honey. The one thing that stands in the way is your willingness to take that first step. That willingness to turn the page on the past. My grandmother was a week shy of 104. She used to talk to us a lot about the good old days. Y'all remember the good old days? She talked about making her dresses out of flower sacks. She talked to us about how they got uh, coupons or, or ration certificates for flour and for sugar. Didn't have anything. Raised most of the food that they ate. Go and visit their neighbors and sit on the porch and rock. Those were the good old days. Do you know when those days were? During the Great Depression. And I asked her once, I said, well, Grandma, why do you call that the good old days? She said, because we had time for God 
and time for church and time for each other. We're in such a hectic pace in our lives, we don't even have time for ourselves. Folks, God has a plan for your life. He doesn't mean for you to live hectically. He doesn't mean for you to be overwhelmed with everything going on. Turn the page. I can promise you that God's plan for your life is much better than anything you ever envisioned. Claim the promise of his presence. What if I fail? One of the great holdbacks for our lives as men and women of God is the fear of failure. I'll never forget talking with my dad one afternoon. There was a little girl when I was in high school that I was infatuated with. She was gorgeous. I wasn't. And I went to talk with him. I said, you know, I, I really like her. He said, why don't you ask her out? No, she'd never go out with me. He looked at me, kind of smiled. And he said, Mark, let me give you some advice. For all the little girls that you never ask out, you'll never go out with any of them. If you don't ever ask, you're never going to know. And man, did y'all see the babe that God gave me? You miss out on all the joys and the blessings of God that you never ask for. You miss out on all the peace and all the things that God wants to put into your life because you're afraid to stake your claim. But the promise of God is real. I've lived it for almost 67 years. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than I can think or ask. Folks, it's time to come out of the wilderness. It's time to stop just roaming around from place to place, thing to thing, and never really finding a place to fit in and to use your gift in your life for the kingdom of God. If you want to enjoy the rest of your life, live your life with a purpose. And there is no greater purpose under the sun than walking with Jesus. It's time to make your move. Let's pray together. Father, this morning as we have gathered in this place to worship, we thank you for the men and women and the young people that are in this room today and those that are listening via the, the internet. And Lord, I realize that so often many of us find ourselves saved. We know that when we die, we're going to heaven, but in this process of something between salvation and, and heaven itself, we, we get lost. We wander from thing to thing and place to place and never feel like we have purpose. Never feel like our lives are making a contribution. And Lord, today we realize that all of that can be different. Today can be a brand new day. We can walk out of this building with a brand new experience knowing that our life matters. Our task matters. And so, Father, I pray that as we sing this commitment hymn together, that you're going to speak to every heart, every life. Show us today, Lord, what we need to leave behind. Show us the next step that we need to take to be more like you. And Father, may we realize that because you are present with us day after day, that we can do all things through Christ who has given us strength. Speak to us, Lord, as we sing together, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to offer you a very simple invitation this morning. And I know for most of us, invitations are scary. I'm going to ask you to slip out of your seat, walk down to the front. All these people are going to be looking at you. Isn't that awesome? For this church family to watch an individual walk down the aisle and say, there's a man or a woman or a young person that's serious about God and wants to make a difference with their life. You never accidentally become a follower of Christ. You never accidentally become a witness in the kingdom of God. It is an intentional decision. And so I want to ask you this morning, would you be willing today to take that next step? 
to close whatever chapter of your life is behind you and become a brand new creation in Christ and let him use your life. Maybe you're in this room this morning and you have never given your life to Jesus Christ and all of this is foreign to you. You have no clue what it means. Folks, you can have a brand new life today if you'll let Jesus Christ be your Lord. And so as we sing together whatever decision you need to make this morning, if God was spoken to your heart, we invite you to come while we stand and sing together. <clears throat> I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Father, we just thank you for this day. Thank you for being here. Thank you for hearing us when we lifted our voices in praise. Thank you for sending us a message to change our heart. And Father, we just ask you that we'll take what we heard today and use it to motivate us to be missionaries out in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.